great pleasure that um, that uh, that uh, we we welcome today Sarah Nichols, um, who is uh, currently uh, assistant professor at Rice University. She completed her dissertation um, at the uh, ETH Zurich on. Um, well, constructing concrete in Switzerland and, and the story of the political economy of concrete in Switzerland, and she will discuss that today. She's uh, graduated from the University of Michigan and uh, the Berlage, and um, has been holding this position at Rice University since last uh, January. Um, so it's it's our great pleasure to um, introduce Sarah. I will introduce um, our other uh, respondent, Donald Mack and Guillaume Aber, uh, right after. Um, Sarah's uh, talk and before we actually jump into the conversation. So this is part, of course, of uh, our ongoing uh, lecture series um, collaborative effort between ETH Zurich and the Harvard GSD uh, on uh, materials and on, um, let's say, um, uh, uh, say accumulations um, and, and the conversation on how somehow uh, architecture and urbanism also um, are, uh, let's say, to engage with this discussion on the uh, use and uh, exhaustion of resources in, in a kind of more general uh, conversation. And we're really happy to have um, these uh, two other respondents, which, uh, as I will introduce later, have a, a, um, a different uh, perspectives on that particular material that Sarah will uh, discuss today. So together with uh, Milica Topalovic and Hans Hortig, uh, we are uh, delighted to leave the floor to Sarah Nichols. Great, thank you so much Charlotte and thank you Milica and Hans as well for the invitation. This is, um, this is a really special one because even though I'm in Houston, this is a kind of uh, return to where I started this research in the sense that when I began this project, I was organizing the predecessor uh, lecture series to this, the Urban Mutations on the Edge with the Angelou chair, which somehow has completely changed into this new format. But um, so it's nice without being able to travel back to, to Zurich to be able to, to present here again. So um, I'll get started. What is embedded in a material? How is a material rhetorically, materially, and technically produced? And how do these constructions condition its use? And so to talk about the territory of material, I think it's also important to take on such questions. And so I'm gonna be sharing work today as Charlotte already explained from my dissertation project that has examined concrete in Switzerland. And I'm gonna talk about how concrete has been historically and disciplinarily contingent, designed essentially over and over again. So its composition, consistency, and intended uses have changed. The means of delivery have changed, its surface has changed, and perhaps most powerfully, conceptions of the material also changed, often developing as powerful visions for shaping what the material would become, even at times when those ideas were hard to square with concrete as it existed at the time that such visions were put forward. So, Concrete is a building material, but also an assemblage and a process. So this meant as a stand-in for also questions about labor and energy that go into this material process. And through this multiplicity, it draws many things together. So to look at concrete for me has also been to look at many of the different things that have been part of its making, technical, environmental, ideological, and the relations between them. And this has from the beginning been one of my interests in it. So to understand what is embedded in the materials that are used to make architecture sheds light on, as is implied through the process sh shown here, again, the ideas, labor, and energy that building materials rely upon. So as you're doing in this series, this view on materials, I think, is also about talking about the necessity in architectural culture more generally to bring to the fore the social, political, and ecological impacts of construction in which we are all in different capacities entangled. So my dissertation is a history of concrete in Switzerland that begins with the appearance of industrialized cement production and material research in the late 19th century and ends with the oil crisis of 1973 as a moment that briefly put the brakes on the unmitigated acceleration of development that had characterized the post-war period. And looking 
in this case, really a concrete as a broad phenomenon rather than specific concrete in sort of special buildings, the Swiss concrete image that we would kind of have in our heads. Um, over this period, concrete went from a material being used occasionally, first as isolated tests, later as isolated projects, to one that is ubiquitous through all of these well-known sites of use. And part, of course, of a networked territorial project. So on the left-hand side, the network of a hydropower project that we'll see later in the talk. On the right-hand side, a highway exchange just outside of Zurich crossing with a um, um, ice <laughs> uh, trash burning station. My English is, is uh, somehow a bit confused right now. Um, so, in a, so, so these cumulatively, in a phrase used by Gideon, effectively a redesign of the Earth's surface. And it's this shift from a new material to an unavoidable material that frames this work. I wanted to understand if concrete is ubiquitous, which of course it still is today, then how did we get here? But what is it that we talk about when we talk about concrete? Buildings out of concrete? Concrete is a material in the abstract, the wet slurry? What about as a commodity, an industrialized product? Or does the, is the material actually cement and concrete something else, an assemblage? To take on this question of concrete as a whole means to talk not about one thing, but about many. From each view, it would be possible to depict different ways that the material or thing or hyper object of concrete was working. So, in order to do this, I trace the establishment of institutions such as EMPA, the Institute for Material Research, and the organizations of the cement industry. Ideas such as that of the monolith, which of course was very important for concrete, and techniques from the end of the 19th century through to the end of the interwar period, the outbreak of World War II, that I argue enabled the mass development of concrete in the post-war period. And so, and this is a deluge that is representative of a mindset of development that still governs the production of the built environment today. Organizationally, technically, and conceptually, specific developments allowed concrete to be treated as a material without limits. Yet by unraveling how this history unfolded, it also becomes clear that it wasn't an inevitable or smooth development, but one that while willed from many angles was full of contradictions. As you see on the graph here, cement consumption per capita in Switzerland, um, which is a good index of concrete use, shoots up rapidly in the 1950s. And by the end of that decade, Switzerland's use per capita was the highest in the world, which was a marker mar reached multiple times before the oil crisis in 73 and the crash of the building industry that came with it. And so it's this development, this, uh, this rapid arch um, at the beginning in the 1950s, that if extreme, fits within a larger pattern of increasing material intensity. First, in many places on the globe, of course, concrete is becoming ubiquitous along a similar trajectory. And, and the same thing holds for materials in general. During the last century, global material use increased eightfold. So humanity currently uses almost 60 billion tons of material per year, within which, and Guillaume, I think, can talk about this more in the discussion afterwards, the greatest exponential growth and greatest use was construction minerals. Needless to say, this isn't slowing down. So today, if the cement industry were a country, it would be the third largest CO2 emitter in the world behind China and the US. And to stay with this for a moment, this is a wicked problem in which architecture is a major contributor to the ecological crisis that we find ourselves in today. Tim Morton, has written about the problem of quantifying climate crisis, that the data, as necessary as it is, depicts a scale so vast that we, not just as individuals, but as institutions, as nations, can feel effectively paralyzed or stuck chasing small fixes that don't address this bigger picture. And I wanna add that these graphs have another power, which is to naturalize the crisis, to make it appear as if it unfolded as an inevitability of capitalist development. And while the arc of overall development can't be denied, looking specifically using a deductive approach as I've done with concrete, but which I would like to pose as a broader potent tool, 
that looking at specific situations gives us a way into these big problems. Looking specifically denaturalizes what from the overview appears totalizing, breaking down the emergence of concrete into a nonlinear confluence of a number of disparate things, some part of broader shifts in building culture, some persistent anachronisms, and some accidents. So, and so with that, I'd like to turn to the beginning of this era of concrete, a beginning that has no clear origin point, but is rather a slow and nonlinear shift across the 19th and 20th centuries. So if we turn back to the middle of the 19th century, what was this world that concrete was about to enter into? And it was an era where building and material supply were in transformation. And it's important to remember, of course, that concrete didn't come out of thin air. You've heard of Roman concrete and cement and lime were of course being used for mortar, white, whitewash and plaster. So modern concrete or industrialized concrete, if that sounds better, arises out of these traditional industries for binders. In the early 1800s, there were workshops for mortar, whitewash and plaster that began to produce new cements and hydraulic lime as part of this first small, first small shifts. And these were small and distributed businesses. So farmers, for example, had been making plaster on their land for centuries in Switzerland. More broadly, within the Swiss Gemeinde system, many resources, grazing pastures, forests, and quarries were communal. Citizens had the right to, re to these resources for their own use. They, the know-how about these materials was also local. The use of stone, for example, was based on how it had weathered in earlier structures. And this localness was reinforced by the difficulty and expense, both for transport and cross cantonal duties of moving heavy materials. So in short, large scale material enterprises were uncommon in Switzerland until that point and materials were treated as much like common resources as they were products. And so when customs duties between cantons were lifted in 1848, materials slowly began to move. As rail lines began to connect different regions of Switzerland during the second half of the 19th century, the construction of the rails consumed great quantities of materials. But then as these were completed, they also became vectors for bulk transportation. And this set up a recurrent pattern of a reflexive, reflexive relationship between the development of infrastructural networks, whether rail, road, or power, and the development of the material industry in which infrastructure both consumes materials and also fosters other uses that then in turn require even more material. Yet also with deepening industrialization, many communally managed resources were being privatized, mining rights were sold off and building materials were increasingly regarded as commodities. In the realm of construction minerals, both new and old materials were increasingly being produced by big enterprises reliant on large scale capital intensive production methods, in turn requiring more expensive machinery and more energy to operate them. So this is both for cement and lime, but also for stone, which I think is an important point, which is that, you know, it's not that stone was saying, staying the same and then these new materials were being introduced, but rather everything is getting kind of upturned at the same time. So in parallel, the craft nature of construction was also changing along similar lines, more energy, more machines, larger companies, larger scales of capital flow. So out of a context in which building materials were traveling farther, being produced by bigger companies, used for structures that were engineered and calculated, a context where in short, the traditional tacit modes of empiricism were breaking down, building materials needed to be comparable for these new terms of performance, enter, testing and norms to establish standards. And so against the backdrop of concrete being introduced, both new and old materials were more likely to be used by tradespeople who had little familiarity with them. So again, all materials new and old were being confronted with questions about durability and were being understood in new terms of performance. And I emphasize this because it explains one of the reasons why concrete kind of found an opening in this period. So following other European institutions, the Institute for the Testing of Building Materials that we now know today as EMPA um, was established in 1880. And as this happened, cement was still a nascent industrial product, which allowed concrete to develop alongside this new field that would later become material science. Testing procedures were developed first 
such as drawing time tests like those conducted on this automatically registering apparatus shown on the right. Yet until the interwar period, despite the desire for scientifically informed development of the material, site practice often ran ahead of research. As was reflected, for example, in the first provisional norms for reinforced concrete in 1803 that were based on suggestions from practitioners rather than on experimental results. And so this view of a lab struggling to make concrete scientific complicates the modernist narrative of concrete as a laboratory born and thereby scientific material. So while the lab was indeed an important site, the lab was also often running behind practice and the contributions of these researchers were equally outside of the lab, such as through organizing the cement industry, which I'll talk about in a little bit, or as is shown here, commissioning surveys to identify where the geological layers for cement production could be found. So by the end of the 1800s, Concrete structures were being tested and displayed, sometimes both in public demonstrations, hoping to convince a reluctant public that it was safe. In this case, at the 1883 Swiss, Swiss National Exhibition in Zurich with a bridge that was nicknamed the Little Devil's Bridge and which was tested to successful failure um, by EMPA. But at the same time, the use of concrete was already becoming widespread in certain sites as masonry elements, whether decorative or infrastructural, as part of, a, as, a, as part of new water supply networks and canalization strategies, and as foundations. So often, although it was gaining use, it was often unseen because it was either underground or in some buildings, often hidden or camouflaged. And supplying these structures was a cement industry that already at the turn of the 20th century was taking a form that would hold until the 1990s. So already in 1883 with EMPA, the founding director Tetmeyer needed centralized support for funding and, um, and also to have an audience for, for his test results, something that maybe still sounds uh, familiar today. And so with his prompting, the cement industry formed an association of producers whose close coordination, especially with the later development of the cartel, created a powerful mechanism for driving the development of cement and concrete in the decades to come. And in 1910, this was followed by the establishment of the cement cartel, AG Portland. And through these twin organizations, over the course of the 20th century, the cement industry's institutional frameworks were powerful drivers for the spread of concrete as a building material through production and supply, research and development, and promotion and ma political maneuvering. So what was this industry doing? First, obviously, it was engaged in the actual production of cement from extraction, which you can see uh, in this image of the Holderbunk factory with the um, quarry in the background, which you can see in relation to the scale of the village. So going from extraction into, into now this factory to the crushing, sintering, grinding and mixing. Sintering of course, an extremely energy intensive process that required the import of tremendous amounts of coal and oil, an import process that of course contests the idea of concrete as a local material um, because securing such fuels became a major activity of the cement industry and then trans transportation and territorial distribution and border wars as well, equally an issue. So by signing contracts with the Swiss National Railway, um, AG Portland coordinated delivery of cements as well. But also they acted through immaterial means, first through research and publicity organizations. The cement industry sought new markets and influenced the perception of concrete. So one way of doing this was with the cement journal Cement Bulletin Journal, which was in fact the most widely di distributed architecture or engineering publication in Switzerland because it was sent out for free to all of these offices, but also politically and financially. And this will look familiar to anyone who received the reading for the seminar. Uh, as this critical organogram shown here drawn in 1946 depicts, the industry was controlled by a group of closely connected individuals whose power also structured other material industries and key aspects of politics, finance, and construction. 
So by the end of the interwar period, the cement industry had thus become a well-tuned operation that produced and continually adapted material demand. And without even talking about what has been constructed out of concrete, the effects of the cement industry were already systemic and even before the turn of the 20th century. As one example of how extensive this material transformation was, in 1899, biologist Georges Surbeck was conducting a survey of mollusks in the lake of Lucerne. And just outside of Rotzloch, he encountered a region where no mollusks, no snails, no marine life was present at all. The lake bed was so hard, he couldn't even take a sample. In 1882, a cement factory had opened in Rotzloch, and so cement had been escaping into the air, falling onto the surface of the water, eventually landing on the lake bed, and it had been concreted. But to pivot a little bit, concrete was not just physically produced, as the wide range of activities of the cement industry also already shows, Concrete was also produced and reproduced conceptually in ways that determined how and where the material was used and sometimes even the very consistency of the material itself. Concrete, for example, comes to be thought of as permanent or monolithic or liquid as an entanglement of ideas, technology, material and form in which material and immaterial are co-producing. So, so take these um, photographs, for example, and look at the way that the material is being poised in these images. I have a collection of photos of men staring at concrete. <laughs> this is a, a good sample within that collection. But, but you know, there's an intentionality behind these images that, that, that can also be read, not, not as kind of neutral documentation, but rather the vision of the, in, of the material that these are trying to pose is something which is scientific is something which is controllable, is something which is examined by us experts, right? And so some of these conceptual productions bring counter narratives and contradictions into view, as I hinted already, that again challenge the notion of a smooth development. So for instance, reinforced concrete ushered in during the large urban expansions around the turn of the 20th century, a moment when cities were not just building out, but also tearing down neighborhoods a visceral landscape of, a, of upheaval, that at this moment when so much was melting, reinforced concrete was posed as a permanent material and thus a seemingly old notion of permanence became anchored and updated in the new era. In hyperbolic cases, concrete was even argued to be potentially everlasting. When evidence of concrete deteriorating appeared, as you see on the right, it was taken as a shock Yet again and again, the same claim was made by repeating generations of engineers and material scientists that such errors had been resolved, that new and improved concrete would endure. An example of how powerful ideas about concrete could be in terms of shaping what the material would become is the specific technical change to wet mix in the 1910s and 1920s. Prior to that, concrete mi was mixed with minimum water um, as it performed better in the laboratory, but it was also laborious and difficult to work with. So at the same time, concrete had long been envisioned as a poured material, even though it wasn't yet in this context. So envisioned by Edison or Le Corbusier as making it possible to pour entire structures like filling up a bottle. So visions of construction without labor. And so wet mix concrete in American development was rapidly adopted in the 1920s to take on fast projects with less labor at larger scales. So you see on the left a diagram from, or, or a section from a contractor showing the way that this um, system of pouring would work where essentially all of the material distribution is coming from the crane and finds its way into place without the aid of any workers. And so this rushed introduction led to a number of problems, such as frost damage at the Vegetal dams on the right-hand side, where the whole surface had to be kind of chipped back and refaced. So this enthusiasm for wet mix concrete suggests that the notion of flow was so powerful that it threatened to supersede other deeply valued qualities of concrete, since 
this wetter mix was with more water was known to both reduce strength and durability. And so after these accidents, the notion of pouring concrete didn't disappear, but rather it was enacted through other means, replaced with plasticizers and pervibrators that could induce flow in other ways. Yet the introduction, the introduction of wet mix concrete, seemingly a purely technical development, ended up becoming significant in unforeseen ways as it flowed like a liquid, thereby producing smooth surface imprints with great fidelity to the formwork a technique that was used in Switzerland for the first board-faced exposed concrete projects, such as the St. Antonius Kirche in Basel. So through this fluidity, concrete as we know it today becomes visible, visible no longer in camouflage. As a bit of an aside, I just needed to sneak this in here somewhere. This notion of the competing conceptual constructions of concrete is the subject of an exhibition I'm curating for the Swiss Architecture Museum that's opening this October. And it's part of a research project with Salvatore Aprea from APFL, Thor Stalder from ETH and Nicola Navona from Mendrisio, um, organized by SAM. And so the exhibition is organized thematically around statements like concrete is rock, concrete is energy, concrete is immaterial, and so on to demonstrate the multiplicity of the material. As visual arguments, each theme clusters projects across time, revealing affinities and discarding the idea of neutral matter. I hope you'll be able to visit as it'll be filled with some really beautiful material that is of course not usually in display, it's locked away in the archives. So with this broad sweep from the middle of the 19th to the middle of the 20th century, to summarize before moving on to the um, post-war, I've tried to show a glimpse of how concrete as a modern material, monolithic, durable, poured into place, arose out of broader shifts in building culture from tacit local enterprises to larger scales of capital and to new concerns for performance and predictability with an industrial apparatus in place that had become a well-oiled machine. Many aspects of these developments were quite literally on display in the exhibition seen here which was opening as war broke out in Europe, literally the last moment of the interwar period. And this is the 1939 Swiss National Exhibition with here the shell of the cement hall by Hans Litziger and Robert Mayot, which was commissioned by the cement industry to both house and advertise their wares. So you see as well, actually the close connections between the cement industry engineers and the contractors able to do, to do such precise work as well. And so underneath this beautiful thin shell was a plethora of new consumer goods, infrastructural products and decorative materials all made out of concrete, paired with the machines demonstrating the processes for testing it. And I see this as a potential turning point, the restrained specificity of the shell at odds with the consumable proliferation below, ready when the war ended to spread across the landscape. And indeed, by the early 1950s, we begin to enter into an era where the scale of concrete will rapidly start to be incomparable to early eras. So think back to these early acceleration charts. Concrete is becoming pervasive, not just in buildings, but really, as we already saw at the beginning of the lecture, part of a territorial project that could be explored through the underground, through defense structures, through roads, or through buildings. One particular development was not just that more and more concrete was being poured, but also that it was being used for projects of ever greater scale. So for concrete to be poured into place, material supply and construction, especially for these large projects, needed to work seamlessly. Supply and site processes had to operate as a whole, meaning that whole choreography of flows was needed for the actual flow of the material to be possible. And so I'll finish the last third of this talk by focusing on one site from this era, impossibly large and impossibly remote as representative of what concrete was in the post-war period more broadly. And that is La Grande Dixence, which is a gravity dam in Western Switzerland that I'm sure many of you are familiar with shown here while it was under construction and in a recent photo from the visit to the site. So the project was proposed by the Swiss Federal Amt für Wasserwirtschaft as a way to concentrate all of the water of the Valesian Alps into one hydropower complex, part of a larger strategy for energy autarky 
after the kind of fuel shortages that brought Switzerland kind of to its knees um, during the war. So construction began in 1951. The dam was completed early, which is something you never hear about infrastructure projects, right? And the first phase of the whole network was completed in 1965. And when it opened, 8% of Swiss electrical production was from this complex, which is of course a staggering number. So crucially, the dam is not a solitary object, but part of a network, as is seen here. Tunnels cut through the mountain range from Zermatt on the left to supply glacial runoff to feed the dam's reservoir, um, and also over to the smaller Cloisson Dam on the right, which then drops to the three power plants uh, seen at the bottom. And on the right, I, I don't know how to show my cursor on the Zoom screen. And so here, another view of how the water was sourced, this time with Zermatt on toward the right. Yet the metaphorical watershed of the project is defined in a number of different ways. Situated near the border to France, the electricity produced was transferred across Switzerland, but was also in explicitly intended as an export product. product. And in exchange for the rights to build the dam, the electricity produced was provided at reduced costs to businesses and homes that until then mainly only used electric lighting, if any electricity at all. So getting materials and workers to all of these construction sites meant building roads for trucks, which meant in turn roads that increased the speed of travel and that were traversable for longer seasons, connecting the villages and opening them to the possibility of ski tourism. Labor, was local, which is unusual for an infrastructure project of this size. So 2,500 people, overwhelmingly men, built the hydropower network and 60% of the workers came from the region. Thus, in addition to the changes wrought directly by the infrastructure, this new electricity, new roads, the wages earned on site and the type of labor it entailed also became kind of secondary engines of transformation. So construction wages were reinvested in the home farm producing new equip purchasing new equipment or cattle or a truck for better distribution. But these same investments also laid the groundwork for a shift away from an agrarian economy as farm work was mechanized, the next generation was sent to secondary or tertiary education. So if concrete was being poured to fix the water of the Alps in place, there was also a fix, not just of water and land, but of social organization of a long-term transformation from rural to urban. To zoom in on the dam itself, as you may have gathered, it's built out of concrete, um, but 6 million cubic meters of it. And it's 281 meters high and 216 meters thick, so longer than the length of two football fields at the base, tapering up to a 22 meter crest. So it's shown here in cross section and all of this over 2,000 meters above sea level and many kilometers from any regional center. The company operating the dam describes it in publicity material as larger than the Cheops pyramid, but useful. In their words, a useful pyramid. <laughs> Charlotte will like this comparison, which I think is really telling in terms of kind of the aims of this as a state project, its relation to labor, and even the way that it's kind of located in, in history. And so despite, despite the fact the building at this altitude greatly complicates construction logistics. Um, it restricts the amount of months it can work, i.e. it's frozen most of the year. It's not the first dam that was built on this site. It was built, in fact, just in front of the Dixence Dam, which had been completed just 10 years prior to the initial conception of the Grand Dixence project. So what you see in the photograph here is this Dixence Dam completed in the 1930s with the white outline of the Grand Dissens to come superimposed on top of it. And this shift from dam to mega dam happened so quickly that not only did the same structural engineer calculate both, but many laborers also worked on both sites and were on hand to witness when 22 years after the first dam was completed, it was flooded as the new reservoir filled, which as you can see was filling even before the second dam was even completed. And so, so this is the moment that it's disappearing below the water level and it remains there out of use underwater, a telling indicator of the rate of flow in the post-war period. 
So constructing Grand Isons meant setting up a concrete factory at the territorial scale. Overall, 1 million tons of cement were used to bind the aggregate together, as much as the entire yearly production of Switzerland in 1951. Based on a contract signed with Ege Portland, the National Cement Cartel, 1,500 tons of cement were delivered per day without any delay over the course of the project, an operation that really would have been unthinkable without the close coordination of the cement industry as a whole, and also with the National Railway um, and so on. So the, the volume of this is much more than what one supplier could deliver. Yet, the cement arriving on site as 1,500 tons per day was only a small amount of the material used in the dam and the bulk of the material from the project came from the area around the site. So 10 million cubic meters of sand and stone for aggregate were excavated from the glacial moraine at Prof Fleury, 2,600 meters above sea level. So you see this uh, sectional drawing from the contractor of this extraction process. And then from there, Conveyor belts transported the raw material to a site just above the dam where the material was crushed, sorted, and cleaned. Finally, the aggregate from the glacial moraine, water in the form of glacial runoff held by the first Dissons dam, and cement, the only material shipped in from elsewhere in Switzerland, were mixed to form concrete, which was then sent by cable crane to be dropped at the dam site. So here, mountainside was operationalized and moraine became monolith. And just to show you a, a recent picture of this extraction site, just to show that the scars of this process are actually still visible in the terrain. So this transformation is the subject of Jean-Luc Godard's Operation Beton, which is of course where I'm borrowing the title from, which was Godard's fil first film, Godard before he was Godard essentially, a short documentary that he shot in 1954 while working on the construction site of the dam. And this was not a kind of uh, romantic wandering around the site filming. He was, he was really actually engaged in the construction labor on the dam and later working as a, as a um, switchboard operator. So the film follows the process of making concrete and casting it into the dam sequentially from extraction to pour. Godard gives the material agency. He shows it exerting force, defining the way of working and organizing the site through its technological apparatus. And the wordplay of the film's working title emphasizes this, La Campagne de Beton, at once the campaign of concrete and the countryside that is the result of its deployment. The film reads the site as a gigantic body that consumes tons and tons of materials, aggregate, cement, water, wood, iron, steel, defining the insatiability of the hunger for development. Yet this narrative of consumption is closely entwined with a geological narrative and one that has been attached to concrete since its introduction. The millions and millions of molecules torn from the mountainside, extracted from the glacial moraine are reassembled as dam. And if the process of construction is considered violent, the resulting form is equivocated with the start, a mere arrangement of rock from natural, slowly constituted rock to artificial, quickly constituted rock. This geological view that infrastructure in buildings out of concrete is an innocuous replication of natural processes, concrete is anthropic rock, was an important conceptual driver in a larger movement toward liquidity and ubiquity in concrete. So while all the conceptual and technological developments were in place for concrete to flow before the outbreak of World War II, it's only in the post-war period as economies grew and Cold War anxieties increased that the volume of concrete poured having been willed into a liquid state across the landscape in a volume not seen or imagined before, hinting at a complete break with the notion of scarcity. For as large as the Grand Dissons project was, it was only a fraction of a much larger movement of material happening in this period. Both technically and conceptually, the shift from the Dissons project to the Grand Dissons project is part, I would like to argue, of a shift to a new scale of territorial systemic thinking, using a material treated as though it was conceptually limitless, 
predicated on a continuous and seemingly unending supply of raw materials, both mineral and carbon. This idea of flow, if interrupted as the taps turned on the oil crisis of 1973 and contested from at least then onward, is still not a model that I believe has been overturned today. Treated as a recombination of what was already on the Earth's crust, concrete became a material without limit. And so that, that's the concluding kind of salvo of the talk. But before beginning the discussion, I'd like to turn back to the question posed at the beginning of how did we get here? What, what this view into concrete um, that I've given today, I think, shows is that the material culture we're in is not a natural or inevitable development, that it arose out of meaning and sometimes contradictory agencies. And, I, and this for me is in many ways um, a very hopeful perspective because for as pervasive as concrete is today, it is from a historical perspective, a recent development. And for me, that suggests that the task is not just to look backwards, but also to look forward. So again, again, in my work, I came across surprising cascades of causality in which visions of a material, impossible at the time they were put forward, were willed into being. And today, as important as efforts are at finding where we can improve, where we can cut back, quantifying the problem, I'm interested in another approach, a serious articulation of alternate material cultures that, like the earlier notion of a wall that can flow into place, are so seductive that they could entice change by drawing us forward. And I believe that such a proposition would have to think about form, about temporality and waste, about extraction and energy, and about the regimes of care and regimes of economy surrounding buildings. And so I'm just putting this final thought here as a hypothetical for the discussion. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah, for this wonderful lecture. I um I would just want to add something that I forgot uh, in my introduction is that um you actually were with, uh, awarded the ETH medal for uh, that wonderful uh, dissertation and and. Um, <laughs> Uh, I will just um, introduce briefly uh, our two other uh, respondents so that we can um, immediately dive into the conversation. So we have uh, Donald with us, Donald Mack with um, Associates at uh, Herzog and Demore since 2009. Um, he's been collaborating uh, with the National Stadium in Beijing uh, on 56 Leonard in New York uh, and the extension to the Museum uh, Unterlinden in Colmar. Uh, and the M Plus Museum in Hong Kong more recently. Uh, over the years, he has become uh, involved more increasingly in the uh, communication objective developed by the office, activities that span um, the conception and production of uh, Herzog and Dumont specific monographs, publication and exhibition. And Donald is graduated from the University of Toronto and collaborated previously with Bruce Mao Design. Uh, and then we have Guillaume Abert, who's uh, professor at ETH Zurich. Uh, he studied biology and geology uh, and graduated from the Ecole Normale Supérieure in Paris with the degree in Earth, Atmospheric and Oceanic Studies and completed his PhD in Toulouse on structural geology. His interest um, in research led the foundation uh, on research on cement uh, substitutes and sustainable concrete. Um, and he's addressed the environmental evaluation of building materials and the development of new binders such as geopolymers. And um, as I said, he holds the chair of sustainable construction at ETH Zurich. So thank you both for accepting to uh, join this uh, conversation with Sarah. Um, I would um, perhaps ask Milica to, to jump in if she has a um, question, then I will um, perhaps continue and then Hans and then we'll loop back to both uh, Donald and Guillaume and then open to the public and to um, students question or audience questions. So uh, thank you Sarah. I, uh, I really enjoyed the lecture and uh, I have to you know kind of personal note I mean amazingly I have I have never heard your lecture before even though you've been working on this topic for for very very long time and you know famously and so on and I'm uh, I'm really impressed and of course I'm I'm impressed by this uh, 
uh, um, I mean, some of the some of the aspects of that story are really uh, almost touching, <laughs> you know. And this basically this uh, kind of a, the the deep uh, transformation, let's say, of the of the territorial social structures that have occurred through. Uh, you know this this kind of coaction of this uh, seemingly um, you know neutral perhaps uh, forces of modernization. You know, like okay, you know the 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 factory arrives. Okay, <laughs> let's uh, or oh, okay, let's build a dam. Nothing will change much, right? We will profit a little bit, but in fact, the whole world changes as a result, right? And I think that's. Uh, that's a, a, a kind of a fascinating description also in the sense that, that it is very hard to, to, uh, to be kind of consciously reflexive or to, to, to have the right strategies in advance because uh, um, you know, the, 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 the kind of complexity of that uh, situation just proves to be too, too high. And uh, so what I what I would like to ask you, I mean, of course, your PhD uh, is is delivered at the GTA, and it's it's strictly, you know, <laughs> the, the role is to to sort of unpack uh, history, obviously, of, of concrete in Switzerland, and uh, and you have uh, probably stopped uh, with with a certain uh, caution from, you know, engaging with the more recent history or present, at least in your PhD, right? So let's see, <laughs> but, so, but now we are in the debate and I'm, I'm curious, you know, what, what were perhaps the more, more recent developments uh, in related to the concrete industry in, in Switzerland, you know, and that, that you think are notable and that would in a kind of a different, let's say, historical perspective, uh, you know, be be worth uh, mentioning, right? So I'm I'm curious if you if you could bring us a bit closer to the present moment, let's say. Um, sure. So the well, the main uh, the really short summary would be that um, in so at the time that this cement cartel was founded. This was a relatively common form of organization across Europe. It, I mean, it was a legal, legal formation. And over the course of the post-war period, the situation in Switzerland in relation to cartels becomes more and more uncommon because um, the US was exerting uh, influence in the countries that received martial funding were, uh, let's say, <laughs> strongly encouraged <laughs> to also work within a kind of free market system, which cartels were considered to be antagonistic toward, although earlier there had been kind of debates about this. And so there is a there were multiple kind of attempts to sort of to challenge or dismantle the cartel system, but this the system basically persisted until the 1990s where it became clear that there was this finally sort of a legal threat that was going to disband the system. And what ended up happening was that the Holderbank group, which later became Holzim, which is now part of Lafarge Holzim, um, as it became clear that this kind of verdict was going to be handed down, they bought out most of the other partners from the hotel, from the cartel, forming a kind of larger corporation. And the history that is um, missing from this talk is that they had also already expanded. I think I mentioned this briefly, but not substantially. They had also already expanded quite, quite far abroad. So Egypt, South Africa, Lebanon, already by the end of the 1920s. And with the end of the post-war, fall of the Iron Curtain um, in the 1990s, with this new group, they engaged in a new, um, a new kind of push of global expansion. And so this history of Swiss concrete is actually not just a history of Swiss concrete, but a history of Swiss cement all over the world in which the material is produced locally, but the industrial organization, the export of machines is still, um, you know, of course, tied back to, um, to the parent company. And so increasingly um, what has 
happened in recent years is that production in Switzerland continues to kind of consolidate into a smaller number of factories, while production abroad continues to expand. And there are real differences in the way that that production kind of unfolds. So if you look at the cement production in Switzerland, um, it, it's uh, organized in a quite kind of sophisticated way in terms of reducing sort of the ecological Im uh, impact as much as possible. But if you look at the operations of the same com company, say in, in India, you get a, a very different picture in terms of the labor conditions, in terms of the efficiency of the factories and, and so on. Thanks. Uh, thanks very much. I, uh, I, uh, my, my hope is that as the conversation unfolds, we will be also, you know, speculating about the future. I'm sorry, I think my internet connection caused some troubles. But I think everybody's getting back. <laughs> it was you? Okay. Sorry. I was just running to restart my router. <laughs> um we were just uh, we were just I, I don't know at which moment we were interrupted everyone my was uh, Militza finishing to discuss about how we were hoping the conversation would then kind of unravel um, so I'm, I'm happy to pick up uh, I was actually um, intrigued I think there's a few um, there are a few moments where you you dropped a few hints in your in your talk on I think um, the design of demand, which I find um, one of the most, uh, you know, unaddressed uh, question in relation to to design disciplines. Um, I think Carla Hein, um, in her talk last week, also mentioned uh, the role of this idea of uh, design of demand in oil um, production and how uh, you know kind of materials that were. Uh, sourced from from that kind of extraction where uh you know touted to, to become what they become today and, and extremely prevalent in our environment in in architecture in, in the spaces that we even inhabit and i th think in the case of concrete and this is something we could probably discuss uh later with with uh, donald as well i think the the way that you 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 mention it um a little bit en passant is also suggesting that they might be um there might be uh, connections in this uh, between the way that um, the, the, sorry between the way that um, so when they the industry the has developed and um, sorry somebody is talking over me um, and and the profession of architecture and design disciplines at large and I'm sure this is not a new question to you but um, I was wondering if you would, you would um, be able to elaborate a little bit in this uh, on these kind of relations. Um, regarding the design of demand. 
Yeah, I mean, I can I can say that generally I don't, I mean, it's not something that I overemphasize simply because I think it's not shocking that, um, it, that an industry would sort of um, advertise itself, you know what I mean? Um, or try and fuel demand for for its project product. This is this is just how um, this is how companies work, right? And so, I mean, I did track through the history and try and understand exactly what the what the precise links were in terms of supporting architecture culture, for example. So there are certain moments like the Cementol at the um, you know 1939 National Exhibition that are really clear moments of of connection and also of really explicitly using a kind of structure to advertise the material. But um, what I found ultimately was that these were sort of few and far between. And that for me, what is far more powerful is, is the, the way that, um, the way that demand was kind of fostered on larger scales in terms of the investment, and there was maybe a little bit more in the art about this in the article that I sent. You know um, that the same people who were investing in cement were also investing in infrastructure projects, bringing them to life, really. And that these are, of course, projects that consume tremendous amounts of cement. I, I mean, I, to talk also about the present day, which I think it's good that we start to kind of make this shift, I could point to the really um, amazing and also kind of horrifying work of Kali Rubai, who has looked at the cement industry in Iraq, and the way that the companies operating there have um, have uh, sort of, in, inter in interviews she's conducted, they're quite explicit about um, fostering a kind of American way of life in terms of kind of suburban development because uh, less density, larger houses means more roads and uh, more cement. Yeah, I mean, and taking that up, uh, Charlotte, like these two threads, right? This flows um, as Sarah's so like beautifully put it together. By the way, thank you for that um, presentation because this notion of connecting flows, the material aspects to design of demand and the, the visual culture around which it um, emerged, I thought that was really um, very insightful, but also quite um, uh, inspiring to see those images. A, a, the date of visualization, the notion of almost this forensic or um, investigative and critical aspect of using um, your use of it, but also looking at someone who used it in that way. Um, in the case of those Pollux diagrams, for example. Um, and then also this visual culture, the use of imagery, like 1880s using photography in that way as not, um, and you mentioned it too, also this construction of the material, uh, the scientific aspect of the material, you know, not the crafted nature, not the locality, but about this um, using photography of science, <laughs> men staring at concrete to become uh, a form of, um, uh, uh, not just a construction of image through photography, but also like, um, how it should be perceived, you know? And I think this um, was also leading to a question of, uh, that you ended on, and it's it great that you mentioned it because this notion of the seduction of concrete and uh, exactly this, how do you see this uh, shift in the contemporary terms of imagery of concrete and how it's presented? Uh, very recently remember going just through um, trade shows or even Ikea and you see them selling concrete wallpaper, you know, concrete um, veneers, how this image of concrete has become a seductive um, form of anti-decoration, of um, brutality or honesty. Uh, maybe it would be great to hear how you perceive the um, contemporary um, presentation of concrete. Is it coming from social aspects from the bottom up or is it actually constructed? Yeah, I think it's always, a, I think the causality is always kind of uh, complicated, but uh, it's interesting to see. I mean, already, um, already in the, I've found booklets from the 
mid 70s that are um, uh, for Kauf's argument for Beton <laughs> from the cement industry, the argu arguments for how you should sell concrete. And it's this really fascinating pivot because suddenly there's a lot of talking points about how concrete is not an artificial material, it is a natural material, it is biologisch <laughs> and uh, you know it come it comes out of the earth and so you know there's this kind of um, like primordial link that starts being being emphasized and it's you know it's sustainable because it can last for so long and so of course like a lot of these are things that we can overturn and so there's there's this moment of pivot where there's a long history which of, of trying to kind of situate situate the material within new Within discourses about sustainability and sort of how to how to how to position this as a material which is which is natural or which is sustainable, and then and then I think the view that you're you're bringing up is 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 another one, which is and this is actually something I'm um, I'm also teaching a material seminar right now, and this is something I've been grappling with my students the last week or two, where I've also played a little bit devil's advocate where approaching it from a design perspective, on the one hand asking, what does a material view on architecture do for us in terms of design? And on the other hand, what are kind of the pitfalls? And I think what, what you're maybe pointing to is that, that there, is, um, there is maybe a kind of luxury in terms of, of there is an aesthetic that, that tries to present itself as being kind of stripped down are as authentic because it's showing how a, how a building is um, constructed, but but in in reality, this is an extremely curated view, and that is kind of only achievable under certain certain conditions. Sarah, thanks, and I, I just want to um, to turn to 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 Donald Beck because I think it's really interesting to bring up this um, importance, of, or let's say, the construction of uh, concrete into these visual culture, cultures. Um, I mean, I think the, the, the wallpaper is a very good example of how something uh, becomes, you know, a kind of really part of popular um, lives and, and something that's uh, really uh, banal in that sense. And, and I think it's, it's maybe, it would be interesting to know, uh, Donald, from your perspective, Mm, you know, being in an office that has produced, for instance, uh, I'm thinking about the, the house in Lehman, which is this kind of pure concrete um, icon, uh, how, how that actually percolates into practice um, as a kind of, uh, you know, be, being aware of that, of, the, of those aesthetics and of this kind of aestheticization and what it actually carries um, and, and how that, that would actually be fueling you know i mean i know this is an old project but you know the kind of question of how this circularity of visual cultures uh establish itself um and and then maybe guillaume can can just um continue but uh, I, I would like to circle back to donald on that particular point um i mean one can't deny that certain materials have um, meaning you know the very specific meanings but that's not uh even though the material is ubiquitous the how it's used is not ubiquitous, right? The, uh, how it's used specifically for projects. So um, maybe I can speak about projects maybe more connected to, but at least with the house and name, and it's also very much about um, what we, what you just mentioned, um, this kind of like rawness, but also kind of um, a subversion of itself, you know, of. Uh, of that material because when you go inside it has a very different volumetric character it's always kind of in um questioning or crit uh, critically questioning itself in terms of its use but I also um and this is very much why i also enjoyed sarah's talk the use of concrete uh, as um in this ubiquitousness maybe uh makes us forget about the preciousness of it you know that it is also uh um, in its uh, use or overuse, we could say, we forget that it's the material aspects of it, the gypsum and the lime and the rock, as you said, also, um, even if they can be transported, come from a specific place and have a certain limited <laughs> um, material uh, supply in the world. It's not 
um, unlimited or never ending or everlasting. It's, again, it goes back to this notion of construction. So it's when I see those images of the dam being constructed, for example, it reminds me very much of um, those construction images of the Beijing Stadium, um, the National Stadium Beijing, or currently um, it's just finished, but and, and plus that these things, these buildings, these projects are not um, uh, simply aesthetic <laughs> diagrams or aesthetic constructions. They are an aspect of all these logistics coming into place, like the logistics of bringing um, concrete into these massive structures, for example. In Hong Kong, uh, you could say, uh, for example, uh, when they're constructing M plus, uh, 32 trucks need to come in per day. There's a certain as aspect of this. You only have a certain, certain number of hours. So it, you break it down to like, how many minutes do you have for each truck? How does it pour? And then there's a certain setting time for concrete. It has to, at this time and heat and temperature, um, you, it gives you a certain effect. Oh, it's uh, going too fast, it darkens. If it's going too light, it's not hard enough. So everything that you see is not an aesthetic choice, but actually uh, it comes from, an, um, let's say a place you want to get to, to lead to, but those logistical matters have the most impact on it. And it is like, it's almost a manifestation of physical manifestation material manifestation of those immaterial factors. And that's what's actually um, captured in a way, uh, let's say retrospectively by Sarah, but what makes it also very inspiring is we can take it to lead us to future thinking about the use of the material. Thanks, Donald. Oh. That's, that's a great, great answer. And, and it's perfect to jump directly to Guillaume because of this question of um, how do we how do we look to the future with all everything we know? I think it's great that you talked about the, the fact that concrete has this kind of local locality and all these kind of limitations and logistics. Um, so beyond the kind of visual uh, and structural aspects, of course. Um, so, so Guillaume, perhaps uh, you, could, you could tell us a little bit about um, you know, how your work also kind of infiltrates uh, all of the conversation that, we, that we're having now. Yes, I mean, first, first thing, thank you very much, Sarah, for the for the the very inspiring presentation. I think it's quite, uh, yeah. It, I have to say, I yes, I know your work, but maybe not to that extent of all the questions that you had inside. So I'm really, really happy to see all the different pieces coming together, and and uh, and uh, I mean, this uh, uh, me, I had, I had. I was thinking before we were discussing about logistic, but first I, I, I was thinking on on the let's say the Swiss uh, the, the growth curve of cement that you that you showed and saying somehow you stopped at the peak, which is kind of 1970s, and and then we have 50 years and we arrive now somehow and and I think it's kind of interesting because the the like what you or. Let's say I would like to know if, if you, you, you what you think about my thought, but uh, what you were saying about the fact that you uh, infrastructure consumes cement and then somehow you have the cement capacity and so you're able to transport it. And so you have kind of this feedback, positive feedback loop, which uh, of course are linked with a certain uh, production capacity because you need to produce the cement and somehow from what you showed beautifully is this, this uh, first, uh, well, beginning of the 20th century basically is a buildup of the production capacity, which at the 1970, you arrive to kind of the, the production, I mean, a bit less now, but somehow we have a production capacity that is uh, viable for all the, all the cement plants. And do you, how, or do you think it would be one stretch too far to say that we have built in the 70s this kind of production capacity, which kind of survived during the next 50 years now. And that, uh, like, maybe now is the moment that we could think about what do we do, because somehow we arrive to this end of the, I mean, in terms of capital investment and et cetera, somehow we have this old cement plant which we don't need, they don't need to produce anymore or they are, they are fading out a little bit like the nuclear power plant somehow, you know, they, they have, well, they produce and now it's like 50, 60 years, we need to close them down. And, and is it, 
is it kind of the moment where we could think, uh, let's say, what, yeah, <laughs> afterwards somehow, how do we do? And uh, uh, yeah, I, well, I, I, don't, I don't know if you, if you think it's it's kind of that somehow we are arriving at the end of this, uh, well, age of the infrastructure somehow. Yeah, that's an, I think that's a really interesting view. I mean, one thing that I was thinking about was, um, which didn't come up in the talk because I'm kind of talking about the, you know, we've had a lot of discussion about how the sort of era of, of grand projects is, is, has, has ended, right? And um, there are sort of different ways of, of, approaching, of approaching this, whether we talk about now being, you know, in more in a kind of phase of, of maintenance or, you know, for certain tech bros of the possibility of disruption. <laughs> but, uh, but I think one of the things which is, which is actually a really important point, so I'm glad you bring it up in this way, is that, um, that one, of, one of the things about all of these things that have been built is that they all need to be maintained. And so I have seen numbers from studies from AAVOG that um, so like um, Lichtensteiger and kind of this circle of researchers who have said that essentially just to maintain all of the concrete structures that we have would more or less kind of support the level of cement consumption that, <laughs> that we have um, today, which I think is a really, really fascinating view because it's a it's another way that with these kind of let's say large scale technological systems that you get kind of locked in to into a certain form so the reason why actually when i started this research project i i wanted to write about the post war and it was interesting where I, every time that i wanted to write about the post war i kept getting pushed kind of earlier and early earlier because i realized that so many of these structures kind of set up what what happens later and kind of lock you in, in in certain ways and I think we're we will still be feeling the the effects of that for a very long time. That, that's a very <laughs> not so much op optim optimistic way of thinking the future, but I think it's I mean it's quite nice because it's the it's effectively this kind of feeding back of the the let's say the production capacity that you need, I mean, supply demand, basically, that at one point you will, even if we are in a different world where we would not have the big infrastructure project, they are there and you need to maintain. And so we will need still to rebuild the new cement plant. <laughs> But, but yeah, in a way, so it loops to to this thing about sorry sorry to 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 jump in, but this discussion about the design of demand and in a way, if it's the design of maintenance, I mean, it also speaks about uh, the pivoting of design professions. I mean, this is something that that has been, uh, you know, let's say addressed by by f few people, and I think that this is something that we are we are going to to have to face as design professions um, in any case, which uh, you know. The, the kind of urgencies um, that we we are refusing to face um, are going to to catch up, and it's it's it would be necessary to act before that. Um, and also, what does it mean? Yes, Io, to, sorry, on, but no, no. But what does it uh, maybe as a designer, if you have this need, like the as Sarah said, it's like the business as usual will will require as much cement just to maintain. So it means. How do you design a maintenance of these things, which requires much less material? And it's not just how do you design a dam that requires less material? It's not the question anymore. It's the yeah, but it's not the, the infrastructure is still there. So if you don't think about how do you maintain it, then we consume. We have to consume cement. And exactly. I mean, it's probably also about deciding what 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 will be maintained in and the what first do you place, don't. right? Yes, exactly. exactly. What you what you not maintain. Mm. Um, I, I would, uh, I would, Guillaume, if you would, you like to perhaps mention something uh, in relation to your own um, research. I, I mean, I think it's nice that you talked about maintenance, and and I know that uh, a lot of your work is also looking at how, I mean, sustainable con concrete. Is it like sustainable oil rigs? Does it really exist? Um, yeah, I, mean, I want to have... provocate you a little bit in relation to what Sarah was addressing, and then maybe we we open and turn to our students. I mean, I had one maybe uh, because I'm not sure, trying to 
<laughs> Not that I'm trying to avoid the answer. You're to trying the to duck, duck the question. <laughs> but I had, an, or, or let's say, me, me, yes, I mean, one way is to say, oh, you produce sustainable concrete. The easiest would be with the super high tech carbon capture and storage facilities which will require more infrastructure for the energy because you need a huge supply of energy to make it so so i think it's the it's it's the the very follow it would follow exactly the same way as, as you have it's like we oh we have the solution for sustainable things is to have carbon capture and storage or oh, we need to produce so it may, might be not with concrete associated but will be PV panel, etc., to supply the energy to do your sustainable concrete, and you, and you build up the new infrastructure of tomorrow that then you need to maintain. <laughs> but so, so that's that's one way for sure. But and maybe you can we can discuss that. The the, the other that I, I find really fascinating and I had never seen that is the the test that the 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 shrink the whatever it was called the consistency test like the you had the image of a, like whatever this small blocks of concrete the way you have the cracks and you see if, how much crack it makes and and i i, I mean for me i i'm i find it very exciting because i mean first now we never use this kind of uh, very empirical test anymore for concrete but it's exactly the test that we use it for earth It's like now if you the the, the test on site is like is the earth good for construction it's is this you make a mud bowl and you fold it for one meter high and then if it makes three piece it's good if it makes seven it's not that good if it makes one there's too much water so it's like it's it's this and 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 so i'm i'm thinking like as engineer, sh because that's a bit what I'm doing somehow, I think it's do sh should we engineer the earth from this super empirical test to what we do now with concrete or, or it's just a bad idea because we will end up with this somehow with the same engineered material. I, I don't know how to formulate, but I, I like this test is somehow is the, is the test of concrete before the big drop. I mean the big jump, I mean, and, it's the and it's the test that we do now with Earth. So, <laughs> I, yeah, I I don't know, but <laughs> I find this uh, well surprising. And there's there's an analogy of where do we go with both of these materials that question me somehow. <laughs> Guillaume, can maybe you um, also with your perspective, what I thought was amazing and Sarah's. A presentation about these mollusks, you know, who were, which were, um, or the, the lake bed, which disappeared from the, because of the concrete dust. I mean, when people are looking at sustainable aspects, not just at the engineering of the material, but the holistic environmental implications, for example, as um, revealed by this uh, mollusks image. Do we see that currently now in sustainable practice, not just the engineering the very um, perfect and sustainable material itself, but looking at greater aspects of the material use? Should I, and, I mean, I think so, so I don't no, know. No more concrete models playing around? <laughs> No, but I think Sarah is what, is what you were <laughs> oh, saying. Oh, Sarah, is, yes. <laughs> I would be curious about what, because I think it goes to what we do in, I mean, like Switzerland versus overseas impact. Like you have the super clean cement in, in Switzerland, no? I mean, I don't know, Sarah, but. Yeah, I mean, it's now in Switzerland. It's, yeah, it's exactly that. It's super clean now because, you know, any, there's also a profit motive for it as well, right? Any, any material that you lose is material that you can't sell. So, so there are a number of, so, I mean, there have been a number of different eras of kind of reducing the amount of dust that these factories kick up. But again, it's those filters also cost something. And so without regulations that would maybe fine you above a certain particulate level, um, the motivation is not necessarily um, there. So it's, it's it, the way that I describe it sometimes is that, you know, you have, okay, concrete is not, not any more sort of one standard, right? But for a long time, you had a really normed material 
But what I think is really interesting about looking at the conditions of production is that you can begin to understand that even something that in a building might look exactly identical if it is produced in two different places in really critical ways, it's, it's very different in terms of labor, in terms of environmental impact. And so I think this is, this is one of the things in terms of design that of course um, can be really difficult to grapple with because we talk about designing concrete buildings. Do we talk about where the cement and aggregate is going to come for those projects? Not necessarily. Some, sometimes we do if we want a really special air, aggregate and you know we want to expose it and cut through it or um, if we want a particular color but kind of on the on the terms of also what this means in terms of um, these broader costs it it can be difficult even to kind of get the information needed to make like an informed decision thanks Dara and I just want to 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 complicate a little bit what what Guillaume was saying about the clean um, Swiss uh, concrete factories versus the, the kind of foreign. Uh, you've been in Switzerland for too long, Guillaume. You're believing, starting to believe the, the kind of uh, pristine Swiss narrative. I mean, the question of, for instance, uh, let's say the drive to, to, to develop infrastructures. I think Switzerland is the country that has the most ongoing construction sites. Everything is always being constantly uh, repaired and you know even destroyed and made new uh, versus I mean which is a, about also kind of um, I mean you could call it forms of corruption because it's about you know kind of uh, maintaining a kind of a market sometimes perhaps even artificially I would argue so um, just to, to complicate a little bit that that point uh, I, I think there are a few questions um, I'm turning to Carrie uh, one of, of um, our GSD students, and then I think uh, Elif also has a question, and then perhaps we can circle back um, to our guests. So, uh, Carrie, are, are you here? Yeah. Hi. Um, yeah, thank you so much for your talk. Um, it was really fascinating work and has raised a lot of questions for me. Um, for um, the project I'm working on, I'm looking at concrete in Dubai's construction industry and um, how the components of concrete, the sand, limestone, water, um, I'm looking at it as this kind of mass that's displaced from various landscapes um, at specific locations extracted across the globe. Um, and then also looking at how a critical component of that mass is the labor involved in that process, um, especially in in countries such as Dubai, where migrant workers represent the majority of construction labor, um, and kind of how that labor and these displaced workers are implicated in the result of this concrete becoming, um, as you described, this kind of ubiquitous material um, in the context in, in Switzerland. And so I'm, I'm curious what you think about um, in in a contemporary context uh, about how labor is this um, component of concrete and then how um, in your text, you know, you describe this very complex supply chain of the concrete industry um, as you talk about Pollux's drawings and these various different like scientific explorations of concrete. And um, I'm curious how you think about how that almost seems to obscure and make very difficult to comprehend all of these different actors and laborers involved in this very complex system. Um, and so, yeah, those are just some, some initial thoughts from me. But yeah, it's very interesting. I mean, I think in, in general, in, in architecture today, I think it's, it's really critical to uh, to be to be thinking of of labor as kind of one of the mandates of what we do that we understand that when we design something that it's going to be it's going to be built by other people who are potentially um, extremely precarious and so there is of course you know there is of course this now kind of long running debate of of people like Zaha Hadid who say you know why should I why should I care like it's my design but um, you know, the conditions of the construction site are not my responsibility or, but then you also have, you know, reports like those coming out of Qatar 
that say that 6,500 migrant workers have died since the World Cup projects were awarded. And so how can you look away from this, right? But again, I think it also becomes about how we are, uh, maybe the design of our discipline as well, you know, in the sense of how do we actually, how do we make sure that we even have that information, that we have the link, that we have influence over those um, conditions as a looking historically, there is always a challenge of writing about labor because um, what, I, what I talk about is how labor appears when things go wrong. So in concrete, you talk about the influence of the workers in order to blame the workers <laughs> for something going wrong with concrete. And so from a designally perspective, I think well, wouldn't it be interesting, and sorry, this is getting away then from the kind of more politically charged question that you're asking, but I think it's also about the politics of the profession. What would happen if we turn that around and say, well, the workers do have agency in relation to the material as it is unfolding on the construction site, and how could we integrate that into different design processes that are not about some kind of ideal, idealized translation from drawing to building, thank you, Robin Evans, but, uh, but are actually understanding that as a kind of negotiated process. Um, I think Guillaume was, uh, yeah, Guillaume was raising wanna, his hand too, yeah. You wanna... Yeah, yeah, I just wanted to say that I noticed Guillaume's uh, raised hand, yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, but I, I, I it, 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 I think it was a little bit uh, maybe to continue the, the, the discussion on, on this, uh, let's say, logistic and labor associated questions and what is the, uh, let's say, the intention. Uh, I mean, my to make it to make a very simple question, do you think that the 3D printing is the continuation of this? Uh, let's say concrete development, or it is a revolution that will change logistic and labor relation with the materials. <laughs> to make it super who's short. The, who's the question? To, I mean, <laughs> because, the, I, because the, 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 let's say with 3D printing, you officially get away of your labor, but you I have think... to get the super tight logistics of all your material going through your buildings. And I mean, I think it's an, in, yeah, and you have to, you also have to control the site as if it is the laboratory right now, at least, or that's the, the challenge kind of in the sense that you need a kind of, you need a positioning network, you need a flat surface, you need, uh, <laughs> you need um, con consistent conditions that never actually exist on site. So even at NEST, uh, on MPES campus, there was a lot of challenge of bringing this robot from from the lab onto the slab of the building, for example. But I mean, I think we had we um, organized a, a doctoral workshop a couple of years ago on the question of automation at ETH. And Antoine Picon gave a really beautiful talk for that, where he talked about the kind of the history of the dream of automation. And I think that's kind of the best answer to this, which is also what I see within this history, also with this question of pouring the idea of a kind of of a material that could fall, flow into place without any labor is also a kind of dream of being able to remove ourselves from the discomfort I think that we often feel in terms of, um, to put it more bluntly, you know, modernizing projects purportedly in this era versus something, a very messy pro um, process on site that does not corresponds to what, what we think we are achieving, right? And so I always have the feeling that it's not just about efficiency, but also about this kind of discomfort with mm -hmm. that process. Thank you. Thanks. Um, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm turning to Elif who had the, uh, ah, sorry, Milisa, would you like to jump in? I mean, uh, I, uh, I just wanted to, to link that to, to, the, to the question of craft, right? And, uh, and uh, kind of uh, what you described and Donald commented on, on this kind of, a, 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 let's say, um, um, 
change of the of the labor around concrete into being uh, scientific or, or let's say at least the, the the highly skilled technical labor into being scientific rather than 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 the issue of craftsmanship right and and how the the kind of the way that knowledge is uh, to say so spread through society is um, uh, is organized right around and i think that that uh, the the issue also with automation is that it requires further specialization and uh, the kind of a you know production of technical expert whereas i think that uh, you know, part of the new ethics of, <laughs> of architecture, if, if we are, you know, discussing that as well, right, is like uh, um, uh, also, you know, making sure that we have a certain um, uh, areas where the kind of democratic or socialized knowledge of construction is still possible, right? I don't think that, that uh, I don't think that, that, uh, uh, automation is the only solution, right? But I think that there are probably many ways to deal with the with the future of, you know, inherited concrete constructions and the new concrete constructions. And certainly, automation is part of that, you know. But how to how to make sure that uh, that um, uh, you know that that there is a, that also kind of a craftsmanship. Uh, and the small, uh, perhaps, uh, enterprise <laughs> is possible once again, because Sarah's history clearly shows that, uh, you know, precisely the, the kind of demise of these small economies as, uh, you know, as the, as the process unfolded in the, in the end of the 19th, early 20th century, right? So this kind of, a, a, let's say, a, a cooperative local, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera, I think is is in my mind also a very important part, right? If it's not the only, I mean, certainly not the only part, right? So I think it's it's perhaps this this talk or this conversation inspires me to look at the kind of a you know panorama of these options that could that could be to say so applied or existing in parallel, right? But how how can we you know make sure that that uh, that there is space for for all of them? Let's say. And I mean, Sarah mentioned it, that we don't yet have full automation of concrete uh, and 3D printing of concrete on sites yet. Actually, when you have those super complicated shapes, it involves a lot of craft because of the formwork. I mean, especially if there's metal or a uh, wooden formwork, it's highly crafted um, in order to take the shape of the poured concrete. Right. I mean, uh, I mean, I, I, uh, it's a, the question is, how do we understand the notion of craft, right? So I, I mean, uh, the craft being, being able to, to produce independently at smaller scales, right? So I think that, that uh, craft you're referring to is to say, so the, the, the skill developed within a very large system, right? Or let's say, you know, designing and, and building, you know, the M plus as, as you explained, right? But it will never almost be, be reproduced at the level of individual house, right? And I, I am, I am uh, uh, hinting at, uh, at uh, uh, you know, craft at, uh, at the smaller scales, right? There's kind of ability to, to build, you know, of, of kind of, you know, where, where, uh, where uh, you know, individual citizen, I mean, today, you know, in, uh, in Switzerland, uh, um, uh, you know, it is it is very uncommon that that a normal person will ever, you know, to say so, do a, a, a certain construction work at home, right? The kind of uh, the D DIY, <laughs> you know, is is another word for that, but. Uh, uh, it is, uh, 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 you know, there is certainly a process of a, of a, of a loss of knowledge in the population, right? Through the through the the kind of um, industrialization of these construction construction processes, right? So I think, is it possible to kind of democratize the knowledge of construction once again, right? To return it to 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 the to say so to the broader. 
um, you know, does it have to be specialist, you know, that, that, does the future that we go toward have to be more and more uh, uh, specialized in terms of uh, knowledge distribution, no? Yeah, I think that that raises a lot of really interesting um, um, points. One of the things that has always kind of struck me about concrete is that um, in this period that I've been, you know, that it's kind of always being, it's always described as something that removed skill from labor. So, you know, it would, it was less, um, less, it required it, you know, the, the stone mason gets kind of thrown off his pedestal, right? But then on the other hand, there are also so many contexts where the amount of labor involved in co concrete is, is too much for it to be really kind of widespread. So I'm thinking in terms of the US that the amount of labor and the amount of skill for concrete is much higher than it is for building a kind of um, platform frame house, for example. You know, you need some really simple tools and not much knowledge to build something out of two by fours and drywall. Um, and so it's always kind of um, contextually dependent and also and again, another kind of contradiction, which I think like Adrian Forty talks about in his work is that there is always this, um, this, this desire to make concrete a kind of specialized endeavor. And that this happens not just in terms of the way that the companies are organizing, but also in terms of the way that the norms are written the way that the way that things are communicated, that there's a kind of certain protection of the engineer um, as figure and the need for this kind of ex expertise, both in terms of calculation and in terms of site control. So Amy Slayton's work in the US has looked at, for example, the establishment of the idea of a site engineer as, as, as um, forming a um, unnatural social hierarchy on the construction site that, that sort of um, encloses knowledge rather than sharing it. Yet, I think at the same time, maybe maybe Charlotte's work in, in Egypt also shows that these networks can be far more complex in the way that you show how um, workers coming back from working on kind of large scale, presumably corporate run construction sites can return home and then use that um, knowledge in much smaller economies, for example. Thanks, thanks, Sarah. I'm uh, I'm going to to turn back to um, uh, Elif because she had a question that was actually uh, touching upon what you said about the kind of specificities of certain um, local uh, criteria, and um, she was actually referring to some of the work uh, on the Grand Dixence that you mentioned. Maybe to to look back a little bit to your presentation, Elif. Would you like to 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 share your question? I'm going to have to hop off because I have a. GSD public lecture to actually attend to. Um, Hans will share with you afterwards the link to, to that if you want to hop uh, into as well. And Sarah, thank you so much for, for the lecture. Uh, Elif, you. go on, please. Yeah, Sarah, thank you so much for the lecture. Um, so you talked about the tunnels built in conjunction with the Grand Dissons and how they brought this means of access to the villages that led to the rise of the ski tourism and shift away from an agrarian economy. So I'm curious about how this shift in the cultural and socioeconomic landscape interfaced with the political and especially the process of local referendums and what I understand is the very Swiss decision-making procedure for what gets built at the local level. Did the building of the infrastructure get lauded or approved of, even sought out at the local levels or was it all still sort of top down? And how these changes in the culture of cement led to shifts or tensions in decision making at the local level about the design of the built environment? So it's a really good question. Um, for the, I, actually, it raises a question that I've never pursued, which is for the Grand Dixons, I've never actually seen. I don't remember there being a history of any local any votes on it. I think. Um, Possibly it was remote enough that uh, that wasn't necessary. But one of the things that I find really um, astounding about looking at this era is the kind of um, the insanity of some of the projects that were proposed without consultation. So the 
best example that I have, it was a proposal for a nuclear power plant that would have um, melted glaciers as the cooling apparatus. And this project was never built, but it was also never widely um, contested. Yet there was a parallel project that was supposed to be part of the kind of same national build out of hydropower that was supposed to go in um, Andermatt, Switzerland. It would, have, it would have made a lake that was much bigger than Gondissance and there was a occupied there was a village there that still exists today. And this is one of the kind of first examples of a really coordinated and at times even violent um, response to the proposed national infrastructure project that successfully fought back um, the construction of the dam only for the village to be colonized by this uh, gigantic uh, Zavirus luxury development <laughs> 60 years later, so. So there, are, you also begin to see kind of the, the ways that local opposition begins to sort of um, work against these, these projects as well. We have another question by Nitin um, in the chat. Um, Nitin, maybe you want to try to ask it yourself or are you around? Oh, Hi Sarah, um, thanks, thanks for the lecture and it was really fascinating work. Um, um, no, I, I was just sort of like, I was really, I really liked the text that you shared with us on Pollux and the diagram was based on um, sort of like uh, chasing the relationships of power of like this sort of families or um, rather institutions that were working in um, sort of transnational spaces. And I was uh, sort of reminded by, because uh, the, the Timothy Morton, Morton text that you sort of cite in your lecture, it's based on sort of these material transitions where he's sort of like uh, talking about, okay, yeah, we can uh, transition into a new sort of green capitalism, but it would be based in the same relationships of um, exploitation and uh, power centers or metropolitans. Um, so I, I mean, it sort of reminded me a little bit of um, this sort of transitions in the global south, uh, not the global south, sorry, the American south, um, where you had sort of the plantation owners transition from sugarcane to um, sort of building cities uh, through sort of instituting philanthropies. And um, I was wondering that in concrete, you see the same, you have the wholesome foundation that sort of like, you know, also trying to sort of spend a lot of money um, into sort of this um, creating sort of like a politics of transition or uh, sort of image building or things like this. And I was wondering because at, at, at one side you're doing quite critical research and on the other you, you also have the opportunity to, to sort of be involved in their work. Um, did you sort of see something that you were perhaps critical of in, in this sort of like discourse or um, in this transition? Yeah, I mean, it was, uh, I was working, I was doing work with the La Fajolzin Foundation when this was kind of the inspiration for this project, let's say. When I started to understand that the material industry was not just a supplier, but that they were operating on so many other levels, whether it's, you know, whether it's through design awards, whether it's through the kind of connections that they hold throughout um, the university structure, um, whether it's also about, you know, trying to just set the tone for conversations about sustainable construction. And so it was while I was working on, um, in that capacity um, that I started to formulate this project. And at that moment, I also stepped um, away from the foundation in order to pursue the work independently, both in terms of structure and um, financing as well. So the financing from this project came from ETH. It did not come from Lafarge Holtzim since I get asked that a lot. <laughs> um, and so I think, I mean, on the one hand, I feel like you're giving them too much credit. You know, it's a small foundation. 
<laughs> that uh, has an academic advisory board um, to whom they give money, who are all of the figure, you know, I'm not, I'm not the only one on the panel that has been uh, involved with this, <laughs> but, uh, but um, so, so I would not necessarily equivocate kind of um, the construction of urban centers in the American South with a couple million in um, financing for what is essentially, I mean, the finan the, fi the money for the foundation for La Fosse is under the marketing budget of the corporation, which I think tells you everything that you need to know about what this, about what this operation is. I mean, it is a, it is a marketing operation. And um, I think it's important, I, I think it can be understood as such. And so um, I don't. I, I mean, are you, yeah. are you saying that Lafarge holds him does not have uh, any serious sustainability strategy <laughs> to speak of? I mean, they are actually not uh, foreseeing a future in which, uh, let's say, concrete consumption will, will dramatically drop. I think it's I, different. Yeah. I, do you want to jump in there, Guillaume? No, 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 please. No, I mean, what I'm trying to say is I, I think that they, I think, well, I mean, I think increasingly what we are seeing is that all of the companies that we are rightly pointing at as being major contributors to um, ecological crisis have known about the effects of climate change for 50 years. And I think um, you know, there's a lot of particularities about the um, about Holtzim and the Schmitani family that make this maybe a, somehow a unique but also a representative story in that the family members in the 1990s became part of a right-wing um, populist uh, political movement in Switzerland that were very public advocates for the free market. And yet at the same time, other members of the family also became very uh, vocal proponents of the need to protect the environment. And so there are these kind of two things that appear in tension with one another and um, their stated way of addressing this is, is to, and I think this is incredibly specific for Switzerland, an idea of corporate responsibility which I'm not advocating for whatsoever, I'm explaining what this position is, which is an idea that as a corporation, you are an actor in society and that you have moral and ethical obligations in the same way that any other citizen will. And if you are a good citizen, you will simply take care of these things. And so for that reason, you can be all about sustainability and completely oppose any, any energy or environmental regulations at the same time which for me is a kind of huge uh, contradiction, right? <laughs> for, for a number of different reasons. So I don't think that, I don't think it's that they don't, I, I mean, I, my project is not to demonize anyone or to, to simplify things to say that anyone is ever motivated only by one thing at a time. And I think one can be concerned about the environment and want to make profit <laughs> at, the same, at the same time. And I can understand how that would put you in a kind of uncomfortable uh, situation, right? That when, when, when you are operating a business that you know is contributing Yet at the same time, as we, we can also see, it's incredibly difficult to extricate ourselves from cement, even if we wanted to. Right. I mean, I, I would, uh, if, uh, is, it, is it okay if I perhaps ask uh, last question? I would, I would ask uh, all of our guests, our three guests to, to answer the same question. Uh, I, uh, I have, uh, um, uh, uh, during the talk, as, as we spoke about the, the meaning of concrete and the kind of a certain uh, uh, aesthetic, uh, to say so, attachments uh, that, uh, that this material has and the, 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 the way that architects have used it, um, I have uh, also thought about, um, uh, you know, the fact that uh, 
the material, as you explain, has been with us for uh, for about hundred years, <laughs> in a in a at the systemic level. That uh, I could say that probably a lot of us, I don't know, us in this auditorium, I I would declare myself a, a child of let's say a concrete jungle, you know, <laughs> or somebody who was raised in a in a let's say dense dense uh, environment, and. Um, uh, for a lot of us, concrete is, uh, is, let's say, a second nature, the only kind of environment we have to say so known, right? So, so I think that that goes deeper than, um, I would say, the, the kind of a, even perhaps environmental concerns, right? Or it, it operates at least on, a, on, a, on both on a, on a kind of very deep levels, right? So I think that that uh, uh, what I'm what I'm uh, wondering and what I would like to ask you is how how do you see the future, right? So what do you see in your let's say if, if you would uh, uh, think in, in positive terms? So don't be dystopian, be positive. Let's say, but you know how how can we address the future, right? I mean, obviously we will need. We will need to to differentiate perhaps between a good and bad concrete, or we will have to we will have to drastically reduce. We will need different strategies. What what, what do you think will will happen or should happen? So I, I'd like to really hear from all of you because each each one of you has a, has a very very um, I think uh, particular and and uh, super interesting view on the on the matter. Would you like to begin? Uh, uh, Donny and uh, maybe Guillaume and then Sarah. Sure. Um, <laughs> I think positive. I think it's interesting how um, it's a bit Carrie's question too is to start to not just look at these um, different materials as things in themselves, but actually to apply kind of critical stance to look at them, the way we would treat every material. So, and it can, it's also vice versa. So the not looking at concrete only for its material possibilities, but it's sustainable um, aspects from labor to material. And on the flip side, you can start to see that some of the um, techniques that the cement industry has applied in the last hundred years as detailed by Sarah has um, whether uh, uh, out of necessity or out of perceiving the success or purely the, um, let's say industrialization of industries that even something we could see as the opposite like wood can start to apply this engineered and um, uh, me mechanical and also uh, not looking, not perceiving itself only as one identity, but multiple identities. So this I find um, the future of all materials that they start to maybe work together a bit more in the sense that they learn from each other, be critical about each other, but also when it comes to architecture on site that um, they'll never be smooth, but they actually start to see this as a kind of palette of um, things that we can use materials as not just one, but uh, a series of tools, the same way that we have to select different tools to apply as architects. Great, thanks, Donny. Yeah, I mean, if I, I, I think I, I really, what I really enjoyed was the, in the, the discussion, that, I mean, in the presentation of Sarah is the, this question of like, from new what you put in the beginning like a new from new to unavoidable and I think this is really what what where how we should think now on 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 the fact that okay we 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 have been driven there somehow uh, and uh, either you put bad intention between behind the seven producers or but I, I think it's much, much as you put it is a much more general idea of the society that has kind of talked about progress and how we should go and somehow the unavoidable consequences of it and 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 I, and I see let's say now as a as let's say 
So at least in Switzerland, probably, if we restrict in Switzerland as, as a moment where there is an opportunity of change, because somehow we arrive at the moment where, as you said, it's like, okay, this infrastructure, they are aging. We don't have this new project, the same, the cement plant, they are aging. We have now the, the I don't know how much you follow, but there's a big protest on the extension of the, one of the quarry of the cement plant in, in the Ecublens. So it's like, we arrive to the moment where it's clear for the cement industry they, they can't go forwards, and and also it's clear for the society that it has consequences. And and I, and and I feel that there's there's a moment of decision of do we do we run for another technology cycle with this carbon capture, with the new whatever solar panel and all the things that will follow again for the next 100 years, or we make a shift and we say as I think as Donald said it's like. Concrete is great at a small amount. There are other materials that are great at other small amounts. And, and there are others that are good also if you put a lot of, of them. But uh, and, and, and it's the moment to, to, to act. And, and because uh, if, like, if we arrive to this net zero concrete that is in the pipeline, then, then we are running again. And, and, and I, yeah, I, I really think the, the way the way you put it is really putting us in the responsibility of like now we have the possibility of using much more material in order that we we take another path. So I and yeah, I hope it with a certain pressure from the civil society, it's probably possible and another architecture culture and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera, it's probably possible, but it's it's the moment to act, basically, I think. Great. Very positive, I feel. Uh, you said it, we have to be positive. <laughs> I was positive. We can, we can do it. <laughs> yeah, I think I'm also very, very positive. I mean, I think, um, so one, one thing that I think would be uh, very promising, which I think Guillaume is actually already doing is uh, with, within his own work is to to take on the design of systems and not just the design of buildings. And so I wonder as, archi as architects or as engineers with a certain understanding of design, I, I think that we can also work on systems thinking. And I, I, you know, I can point to certain moments in the past like New Frankfurt, for example, with Ernst May, that the project was not just about the design of these new houses, but the entire design of how the how the sourcing and kind of construction would unfold and even to a certain extent what the life would be like in those buildings as well. And so one of the things that I wonder is, you know, um, I think I act, uh, you know, is can we, can we also actually design alternatives in terms of what we are relying for, right? Relying on in terms of material supply. And then from the perspective more from architecture, I. I, what I would really like to see and what I think is, is doable is to design not for construction, but to design with construction. And to think, to think about this as a kind of exchange and one that doesn't end when the building is finished, to think about how do we also design regimes of maintenance that also change our kind of relationship to what a building is, um, through these sort of longer cycles, including and definitely not overlooking what it means for the end of life of the building. Great, um, thank you so much. And uh, I think it was uh, it was really inspiring. And uh, last uh, 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 or. A Two weeks ago on Monday, we had a lecture by Carola Hein, and uh, that was a, a lecture on, on oil. And uh, uh, it was clearly, you know, one, one material that to say so created us all, and concrete is certainly another one. And I, I think this somehow presents a, a really a powerful um, uh, um, uh, relationship, let's say, of, of kind of uh, entanglement and, uh, um, um, you know, a, a, a massive uh, question and, and opportunity for the future of architecture. And 
I wonder uh, how how we will go on with the with the uh, future sessions because we will we will have in the I think two weeks from now Jane Hutton who will speak about wood and steel and uh, then we will uh, uh, end with Anna Tsing and I think she will underline probably the the kind of uh, environmental aspects of uh, of all the uh, these to say so entanglements in in uh, 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 supply chain uh, regimes and uh, uh, I uh, invite you to to stay with us <laughs> and to remain optimistic and uh, thank you so much uh, for this really uh, uh, super super enjoyable and and brilliant uh, lecture and uh, and um, uh, fabulous discussion thank you so much donald thank you guillaume and thank you sarah and thank you for uh, for uh, for for keeping us optimistic <laughs> on the big topic of concrete. <laughs>